Good morning. Are y'all really here? Good morning. Good morning. Well, God bless you. I'm glad that you're with us this morning, and we're going to be able to worship together here at the West Freeway Church of Christ this morning. We have a lot of very important people with us. Uh, we have DJ Stuckey is going to preach for us this morning. He is from Ruston, Louisiana right now, but if we can talk him into it, maybe he can be from Fort Worth. We'll work on that. Y'all be nice to him. Don't act like you do normally. Be nice. Yes, this is one of the friendliest congregations you'll ever find, DJ. They're very, very good about welcoming others. But today, the problem is we've got so many wonderful visitors. Don't let any of them get away from you without letting them know how much you love them. But I'm afraid DJ is second today in great importance. We have someone who's come to church for the first time in their life this morning. Bob and Lacey Robertson has brought Aubrey to church this morning for the first time in her life. Would you welcome them? Won't you tell them how great you're... And I want you to do more than that. They're going to bring Aubrey right up here with us. And I want you to get your singing voice on. Uh, Grandma and Grandpa, y'all come on up too. We're not just going to be glad with Mom and Dad. No, y'all come all the way up here. I want to... Y'all come on. But, yeah, come on up here, Corbin, proud brother. Let's show them. This is how we can have a child. Our Savior lives. Are you ready? Amen. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still, the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone Because I know I know He holds the future And Christ is worth the living Just because He lives Amen. Thank you for bringing that little one here. Don't forget, Billy, would you stand up? Great grandma's here today, too, and we're so glad. Thank you so much for bringing her along to worship today. We appreciate it. Amen. 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 Bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. No more important things to do. Let's all stand together, if uh, you uh, will. Uh, 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 wait, wait, wait. I guess we're not standing be, be, yet. Before you stand, John, you can sit down a second. Before you stand, I want those that are with gospel sharing and our campaign workers, we want to recognize you first this morning. So if you're here for the campaign from gospel sharing, there's Jim and Donna Smith. Go ahead and stand. Stand up. The Hardys. There's Larry. These are the workers that are going to be working around in this community with us this week and helping us fish for men and women. So we're grateful for that. Now we can all as a congregation stand. Lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what to say. Friends of mine are lost in sin and cannot find their way. Few there are who seem to care 
and few there are who pray. Melt my heart and fill my life. Give me one soul today. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then wherever you go. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Oh, how sweet hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh, how sweet hope that joy of heaven. Oh, the precious name of Jesus, how it thrills our souls with joy when his loving arms receive us and his songs our tongues employ. Precious name, oh, how sweet. Joy of heaven, precious name, oh, how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Be seated, please. Christ for the world we sing. The world to Christ we bring With loving zeal The poor and them that mourn The faint and overborn Sin sick and sorrow worn Whom Christ doth heal Christ for the world we sing. Christ we bring with fervent prayer. The wayward and the lost by restless passions tossed. Redeemed at countless cost from dark despair. Christ for the world we seek. The world to Christ we bring with one accord. With us the work to share. With us reproach to dare, with us the cross to bear for Christ our Lord. You know, when Terry Casey was our preacher here, he gave a class one time on prayers. And his point was that you're not up here to preach a sermon. You're up here to give a message. So keep it short and to the point. And that we will do. Let us pray. Holy Father, we gather before you today to sing songs of praise to you and hear and understand 
a portion of your word. We thank you, Lord, for the ultimate sacrifice that you made for us. And as your adopted children, we know that you love us and we love you. We ask now that you be with us as we go through this service and hear a portion of your word. And we just thank you for everything you've done for us and all that we know that you will do. We pray that we, when the time comes, we are able to enter through that narrow gate and be with you forever. So with that in mind, we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Scripture reading from James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Zion's call sweetly rings over land and sea, bidding us look to realms above. While the light from the throne shines for you and me, let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne above. While we hear it ringing, let us heed the call of love. On the road to the goal, burdens we must bear, but we have help from realms above. We receive courage new when we kneel in prayer. Let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne above. While we hear it ringing, let us heed the call of love. While we tarry below, there is work to do, and our strength cometh from above. We receive her and way, we must all be true. Let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call coming from the throne above. While we hear it ringing, let us heed the call of love. Our song now to prepare us for our communion with the Lord, rededicating our lives to him, thinking about that time in which he was nailed to the cross to die in our stead. There was one who was willing to die in my stead that a soul so unworthy might live. Path to the cross he was willing to tread all the sins of my life to forgive. They are nailed to the cross, they are nailed to the cross. Oh, how much he was willing. <coughs> With what anguish and loss, Jesus <coughs> to the cross, but he carried my sins with him there. I will cling to my Savior and never depart. I will joyfully journey each day. With a song on my lips, 
and a song in my heart that my sins have been taken away. They are nailed to the cross. They are nailed to the cross. Oh, how much he was willing to bear. With what anguish and loss Jesus went to the cross, but he carried my sins with him there. Will you pray with me, please? Our God, our Father in heaven, the creator of the heavens and of the earth, we bring honor to your name as we approach your throne. We want to continue this ritual, this rite that Jesus instituted, Jesus himself instituted. We're going to break the bread and partake of it, just as he taught his disciples to do. Let us keep in our heart the reason for this and the debt that we owe to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us continue in prayer. Our dear God, as we, as we pass this cup among us, please help us keep in our hearts, our minds, the, the blood that was shed for our sins, the perfect lamb. We, we give thanks for this that frees us from sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
continue with us in prayer. Our dear God, we, we approach you yet again, thanking you for the many blessings, the many riches that we enjoy at your hand. And this the offering that we make now is simply a return of what you have given us, the many blessings. Thank you so much for the lives that we lead, that you have provided us for. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, right now it's time for our little ones to come and show their love of, of the Lord and giving. And once they do that, Mike is not here this morning. So do we have someone that can lead our kids back to Bible times? There you go. There's Chris Falcon. Thank you, sir. Would you stand and everyone look for Chris Falcon? He's going to take you back to Bible times as we stand again and sing our next song. Brightly beams our Father's mercy from His lighthouse evermore. But to us He gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. Let the lower lights be burning. Send a gleam across the wave. Some poor faith, take struggling seaman. You may rescue, you may save. Trim your feet, bull out, my brother. Some poor sailor, tempest tossed, trying now. To make the harbor in the darkness may be lost. Let the lower lights be burning. Send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fate, taint struggling, say mine. You may rescue you. May say, be seated, please. DJ, come preach the word, brother. See if this will work better than it did in class. All right. Again, good morning. Uh, certainly great to be with everyone here this morning. I, I have, uh, I mean, definitely enjoyed the singing. I love to sing. I love to worship together. Um, that, was some, that was some beautiful singing, uh, lifting up our hearts in praise uh, to our God. Uh, this morning, if you have your Bibles, if you would turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. And today we're going to be talking about spiritual growth and how we can grow or what we need to do to grow as a Christian. And I think we all understand that growth in, is an essential element of being a living being. Right? Once you stop growing, the only place, place left to go is down. Right? Once you stop to grow, you start to die. Right? And I think this congregation understands the importance of growth. That's why we have um, our brothers and sisters here to help with the campaign. That's why uh, we have the, the home missions and school of evangelism. We understand that growth is necessary for life. 
right? We're concerned all throughout our lives with physical growth, right? You know, our, as parents, we try to make sure our kids are, are, are eating right, they're, they're getting the right kind of sleep, they're, they're, they're getting their vitamins, take them to the doctor to make sure that they're growing the way they need to. We're concerned with our, our intellectual growth. We make sure our kids are, are doing well in school. We do our homework. We encourage them to get good grades. And we even desire personal growth for, for ourselves, right? Whether that's learning more and getting better about our job, um, saving up for retirement and growing that retirement fund, learning more about a favorite hobby. Whatever it is, we, we, we understand the value of growth and continually trying to learn. But what about spiritual growth? See, we're concerned with growth in all these other areas of life, but spiritual growth is the most important. Because, brethren, God expects us to grow. That, that is an expectation of being a child of God. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Right? A newborn child needs that milk to grow, and when they are hungry, there is nothing that will satisfy them other than that milk. That's the way we need to approach God's word. And there's an expectation that that milk will allow us to grow into the people we need to be. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12, the Hebrews writer says, By this time you ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and have come to need milk and not solid food. Right? So there is an expectation we progress from milk to solid food and that we continue to grow from being those who are simply taught to having the capability to teach others. See, if we stay stagnant in our spiritual maturity and our knowledge and our commitment, then we're not growing the way that God demands that we should. And the fact of the matter is, is that God has given us everything that we need to be able to grow effectively. He, he's given us the tools, He's shown us the character, and He's promised us a reward for this spiritual growth. So if you will, let's look at our text in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1-4. through 4, And we'll see, first of all, you know, I probably haven't even turned this on. I did not. Look at that. It's amazing what happens when you turn technology and give it the power. All right. Uh, verses 1 through 4 of 2 Peter chapter 1. You, uh, you have the tools to grow spiritually. So to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ... Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We have the tools to grow spiritually. And the first one that he mentions in this passage is that we have been given a faith of great value. He says, to those who have obtained this like precious faith. That means a faith that is of equal value and of equal honor with us. And in this context, the us refers to Peter and the apostles. Our faith is the same faith that we see with the people that we might consider as heroes of the Christian age. Our faith has the same value as theirs because it is all built up and founded on the same person, and that is Jesus, a like, precious faith that is made possible by Jesus Christ. You know, I, honoring Christ can become routine for us. Being here in this building, showing in week up and week out, that can become routine, but we have to remember the reason that we're here is because of the great love that Jesus showed for us. That there is a great sacrifice and a great purpose that brings us together here. It shouldn't just be routine that, well, when I wake up on Sunday morning, I don't know where else to go. I've been doing this for all of my life. It's we are here and we've been here for all of our life because we recognize that there is something great that brings us here. And that is this like precious faith that all of us share. But also, we've been given the knowledge of how to live Notice in verse 3, he talks about um, how God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. I am so thankful that God has given us a record of the things that he 
has, has done and said and taught so that we can know how to live. There's, there's not a question of how we are to live and what we need to do because God has revealed it all to us in his word. In Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. We have been given the gospel as the power of God to salvation. We have been given everything we need to know to be righteous. God has revealed it to us. And there are many things that we can learn when we delve into the gospel. When we look at the things that God has revealed for our benefit. It says here we have all things pertaining to life and godliness, right? And we, if we break those down, we look at the idea of life. All of the things that go into just being a person on earth, living a good life, the Bible covers it. Everything that has to do with godliness, which is how I please God, how I can have a good relationship with my Creator, the gospel covers it. All of those things God has revealed for us, and we need to do it God's way. You know, man tries to find his own way oftentimes, but the ideas that we try to come up with to live life are never going to lead us down the path that God wants us to. And it's not going to lead us to a place that we want to be. Jeremiah 10, 23 says, the, Oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. And we would be better off replacing most of the self-help books in a Barnes & Noble with Bibles. Because those are the things that's going to teach us where to go. To found our life on something that is true and real. That's one of our tools for growth. It is true. And, and, and if we didn't have this, we, we can't grow. If we don't have the right foundation, there can be no growth. You're not going to have a broken, cracked, poor foundation and then try to build something upon it. That, that's foolishness. That, that building is going to collapse. You're not going to have a garden that you know has bad soil and then plant something in it and expect to have something that is of value grow from it. We have to have a good foundation, and it starts with truth. Amen. That is our tool for how to live. We've been given a faith and great value. We've been given the knowledge of how to live. And then he brings up in verse 4, we've been given a reward to look forward to, these exceedingly great and precious promises. That living the Christian life, doesn't just have value for us here on earth. And I fully believe that living the Christian life is going to lead for the best outcomes for us on earth. Yes, there are going to be some challenges. There are going to be some people that may persecute us on the way. But, but overall, we have the best life when we follow godly principles in how we live. But beyond that, we have been given a reward to look forward to in heaven. These exceedingly great and precious promises that this world is not all there is. So we have the tools, we have the motivation to grow spiritually. Secondly, this morning, we see here in verse 5, you are responsible for your own spiritual growth. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue Virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, and we'll get all to that in just a moment. You are responsible for your own spiritual growth because it's implied here in verse 5 that your faith is your own. When it says, add to your faith virtue, the implied subject is that you must add to your faith. It is yours. It should be yours. If you are trying to live out someone else's faith, it's not a faith that's going to take you very far. Our faith has value because it's founded on Jesus Christ, not on any other man. And the other thing that's implied by that is that we cannot add anything to someone else's faith. I cannot, I cannot force another person to grow. I cannot force another person to make godly choices. Now, I can encourage them on that pathway... I can help equip them, but I cannot make 
anybody more spiritual. Nor can anybody else make me more spiritual. I am responsible for my faith just as much as you are responsible for your own faith. Your faith must be your own. And we see this all throughout Scripture in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation. See, Paul was acknowledging in this passage, he could not grow for them. As much as he loved the Philippian brethren and he wanted what was good for them, he could not grow for them. He could not do the work of spiritual development for them. And so that means adding these things to our faith then falls to me. See, God judges each one of us individually. We we are not guilty by association, and I am so thankful for that. But by the same token, we also are not made righteous by association. We are not going to have a, a right relationship with God and the expectation of being with Him for eternity just because we were around holy people every week. We are going to be there because we have dedicated our life to Jesus and through Him have become a holy person and have been washed and have followed in the footsteps of Christ. That's how we have it. It's not going to happen simply because we were near other people who were doing the right thing. So which comes down to this conclusion. We are judged based on our faith and our actions. Exodus chapter 32, beginning in verse 30. So it came to pass on the next day, Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin, so now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Right? Moses recognized, this is in Exodus 32, when he had gone up on the mountain and he came down and he saw that Aaron and the people had made a golden calf to be their God. They had created an idol. And he is going to God and he says, look, I, I, I know that these people have sinned. Please forgive them. But if you can't forgive them, blot me out of your book of life and I'll take their place. And God says, no, that's not how this works. Those who sin will be removed from my book. See, Moses could not make their problems go away. He couldn't take their place in punishment. Israel had to learn to do the things that were right. And Moses couldn't just go in and fix it for them. See, they had to do the work of learning and growing their faith. Then in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. See, our individual actions are judged by God. And we only have this life to please him. So, brethren, I implore you, let's make the most of this life that we have. Let's make the faith that we have our faith. I I don't want anybody in here to have Chris's faith. I don't want anybody in here to have DJ's faith. I want you to have your faith and for that faith to be founded on Jesus Christ. And that you take responsibility for the things that you are doing in your life. That it's not anybody else's fault for where you are other than your actions. And that when you align your actions with Jesus, you cannot help but to grow spiritually and be what God wants you to be. You are responsible for your own spiritual growth. Thirdly, looking in verses 5 through 9, if we want to grow spiritually, then we need to develop the proper character for spiritual growth. It says, Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins." 
Right here in verses 5 through 9, we have a list of, basically, if you want to grow, here are the character traits you need to develop as a person. And if you are working on developing these traits, you are going to grow. And so the first one he says, add to your faith virtue, or excuse me, having all diligence, add to your faith virtue. The root of this word diligence means to hurry or to hasten, right? So not only does this idea of diligence have, you know, continual effort as part of it, but also urgency. There should be a sense of urgency that comes along with my spiritual growth. It should be the top priority, the most important thing in my life should be my relationship with God. Despite what else I am doing, whether that is growing in a career or growing as a student, I need to grow as a Christian in my career. Grow as a Christian student. It is diligence, yes, continual effort, but also it is urgent. Because, brethren, here's, here's the thing. We're not going to grow if our faith doesn't really matter to us, right? You, you take an athlete, right? Basketball player, for instance. If they really don't care about getting good at basketball and they only show up for practice and they're only giving every, you know, 70% effort during practice, that's not going to be one of the impressive athletes, right? They're, they're, they're not going to be one of the goats like, like Michael Jordan or LeBron or Kobe. They're not going to make it because they're not putting in the effort. There was no sense of urgency. There was no diligence in their growth. Those who really succeed are the ones that pursue their goals with tenacity, those who are intentional about the things they're doing. Here's the other thing about spiritual growth is that it doesn't happen by accident. Okay? If you are growing spiritually, it's because you have made it a priority in your life to grow spiritually. And that is what we need to develop. First and foremost, let's make it a priority in our life. We need to have Diligence. Secondly, he says, add to your, with all diligence, add to your faith virtue. In the Greek world, this word described just goodness or excellence of any kind, uh, applied to the qualities uh, of manhood, right? Courage and strength and skill. In this context, it's talking about excellence of moral character. Meaning that we need to develop the courage and strength and skill to do what is morally right. And it sh this virtue should be a natural outgrowth of our faith. Moral excellence should characterize each one of these other traits. Right? That, that in our knowledge, we should pursue it because we desire virtue, moral excellence. That we are going to pursue brotherly kindness because we are going to do it in a way that is virtuous, right? Without virtue, the desire and strength to do what is right, it's hard to cultivate all these other traits of diligence, virtue. And he says, add to your faith knowledge. Morality without knowledge is just opinions. Amen. Let me say that again. Morality without knowledge is just opinion. Okay? Men cannot commit acts we consider evil. Right? Men can do things that are bad, but they themselves can rationalize them as good. Right? They, can, they can, within their own minds, say, oh, well, it was okay for me to steal from this person. It was okay for me to assault and to harm this person. They can do it themselves, but, it, but without knowledge, without there being a real standard, well, that's just their opinion. You saying it's wrong is just your opinion. But we're not judged by our opinions. We are judged by the standard of what God has said. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Hey, if we don't want to be ashamed workers, he says, you need to know what God has said. You need to be diligent, right? Urgency, 
hastening to learn, need to be diligent about adding this knowledge to your life, rightly dividing the word of truth, not just passively accepting these things, but let's look at what God says and really take the time to learn it. Make the time to study it and to make that knowledge part of who I am. See, because the thing about faith being based in knowledge means that my faith is not just about my feelings. It's not just how I feel about a certain thing. It's about what is true about a certain thing. See, faith has to be grounded in knowledge. Number one, because God has never asked us to believe on blind faith. And Hebrews 11 and verse 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay? The, God has provided evidence and assurance that what he says is true by revealing to us these things in the Bible. And we can look at what God has revealed in the Bible, we can compare it to the things that we know of reality, the things that we know of history, and see that these things are true. God has not asked us simply to believe without any evidence to back it up. Our faith has to be based in knowledge. And so we equip ourselves with knowledge so that our faith can continue to grow. Add to your faith virtue to virtue knowledge. And he says next, to knowledge self-control. Probably the, the hardest thing to do is to control yourself. And the funny thing is, is that really yourself is the only human being that you can control. And so that is, that is a, a critical part. If we are going to grow, you know, sometimes doing the things that are necessary for growth, it's hard. It's not something that's, that's, that's pleasant to do, right? Going back to the example of an athlete waking up early and hitting the gym and staying late to practice free throws, that may not always be fun. But there has to be an element where we can deny the things that I want now because I realize there's something greater for me on the horizon. That's self-control. In Luke chapter 9, and verse 23, Jesus says, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. See, Satan is trying to assault us with temptations every day. His agents are in the world persecuting us, tempting us to do evil. But the thing is, Satan only has as much power over us as we allow him to because ultimately, I am responsible for my own temptations. When I sin, it's not because circumstances or anything else. It's because ultimately, I chose to go that direction. That in a moment of weakness, I lacked the self-control to say no to what I wanted and to say yes to God. In James chapter 1, 14 and 15 says, Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it is full grown brings forth death. To be able to control what I want and to tell myself, Hey, DJ, what you want right now? That's not what God says, and you know that what God wants is better than what you want. That, that God's outcomes is always going to be better than the way that you go. Amen. And then probably one of my favorite verses, because of the, the imagery of it, Proverbs twenty five twenty eight says, Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Thinking back to the ancient world, if you lived in a city that didn't have walls, that means that you didn't have any protection from an army that was coming to invade you. Right? They could just walk over the border, and they could destroy you. There was nothing there to keep them out. But if you lived in a city with walls, all of a sudden you had a first line of defense. You had a way to keep attackers out of your business. He says that if you don't have self-control, you're like that city that's broken down, that has no walls, that has no defense. That means anything and everything that comes along that's attacking you, it's going to get through. Self-control is our first line of defense against sin. And when we lack that self-control, it's easy to fall. I mean, there's, we, we're not going to have a choice but to fall because we have nothing to fight back with. And so, to develop the character for spiritual growth, 
must have self-control. Then he goes on to say pers- perseverance. In the original language, this is a compound word that essentially when you stick it together, it's the words of to live or to remain and the word for underneath. Okay? So the idea of perseverance is that you are remaining underneath the pressure of something. Right? You could step out of the way. You could put it down. You could allow it to crush you. Perseverance is to bear up under that weight and to stay there, to continue to remain under that pressure. We have to remain under the strain and triggers of life. There, there, there's, no, there's no getting around it. We're going to have temptations that we deal with each and every day. Perseverance is that quality, kind of going back to self-control, that's not just I have self-control in one instance, but I'm going to dedicate myself to having self-control all the time. Now, I'm not just going to deny myself today, I'm going to deny myself tomorrow and the next day and the day after that to keep going. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 24, Paul says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Right? A runner in a race, if, if every runner simply gave up the moment they got tired, races would be very boring. Right? No, no, no one would ever finish. But he says, you run in a way so that you can obtain the prize. And that requires perseverance. To be able to keep going even when it is a challenge, we run. Proverbs 24, 16 Another one of my favorites says, For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. Right? The righteous may fall seven times and rise again, the wicked falls by calamity. I love that because in this context, the thing that separates the righteous from the wicked is not that the righteous never falls. Okay? We are Christians. We have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, but that doesn't mean that we're perfect. We are still going to make mistakes, and we're not going to make the right choice every time. The difference between us and someone in the world is that when we sin, we, number one, we recognize it as sin, but then we pick ourselves back up, and we keep going, and we keep pursuing God. It says the difference is that when the wicked fall, it's calamity. They stay there. They stay down in the dirt. They stay down where it's messy and dirty and filthy, but that's not who the righteous are. Yes, the righteous, we may still fall. We may fall seven times, but the thing is, if we fall seven times, we get back up seven times, and we keep going. That is the idea of perseverance. Right? Sometimes the hardest thing to persevere through in life is our own failures. Right? I, I, am, I am the poster child for beating myself up, and I'm really grateful for Dana, because sometimes I, I'll be just getting myself, and she'll grab my hand and be like, DJ, it's okay. Stop. Sometimes when we fail, we are our toughest critics. And having the perseverance to say, you know what? Yes, I made a mistake, but I'm not going to allow this mistake to define who I am. Rather, I'm going to define myself as righteous because I am going to continue. I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep persevering. I'm going to live the life that God wants me to live. Because without perseverance... We would simply quit. See, the Lord never said that the Christian life was going to be easy. I believe it's the best life, but it was never promised to be an easy life. We're all going to face difficult situations. But rather than give up when life gets heavy, right, when we're trying to stay up underneath the burdens of life and it's really weighing down on us, instead of giving up, we stay underneath so that we can get stronger. Right, James 1.23 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various temptations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. That word for patience is the same word used as perseverance here. Right? We get stronger when we deal with the rigors of life, when we deal with temptations, and when we come through. Perseverance is the quality that allows us to do that day in and day out. And he says, To perseverance... Godliness. This is reverence toward God. The desire to be godlike should help us to deal with the, the struggles of life. Right? We look at Jesus and all the things that he had to go through. He persevered, and he is God. 
Right? When we have the desire to be more like Jesus, to be more like God, that's motivation for us to continue going. Then he says, to godliness, brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness. As our faith grows and we gain a greater appreciation of God, we should also grow to love and gain a greater appreciation for God's children. See, our spiritual growth shouldn't just look inwardly at me. A lot of growth happens when we start to look outward and think about our impact on other people. Not what can I do for me, but what can I do, what can I do for you? And when I give myself to doing for others, I am going to grow. You know, part of this idea of brotherly kindness is an understanding that we don't have to go through life alone. We must help others, and we have people to help us. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4 says, Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Yeah, we do have to take care of ourselves. But we also need to be looking out for others. But also in that is, or I hope should be, the assurance that others are also looking out for us. Because brethren, you know, when Jesus established the church, he established a community, right? The church means those who are called out, meaning we've been called out all from our individual lives in different places to come together as one unit. He doesn't call us just to have a, just a personal relationship with Jesus, to be off on our own trying to live a life. He called us together. Because, brethren, he understands that we are stronger together. Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 12 says, Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. We are stronger together. And brotherly kindness and our spiritual growth, that's what allows us to grow together. And I firmly believe that when the relationships between people and a congregation are strong, that's going to lead to stronger individuals as well. Right? We need to develop brotherly kindness. And he says, to brotherly kindness, love. Agape love. The, the selfless love that looks at the good of another person, even if it's to my detriment, I do what is good for them. And this comes in different types. We have first our love for others. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Meaning if I'm trying to do something for other people, but I'm not really doing it with love, and I don't have a real desire for their best interests, it's just noise. It, 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 it's not worth anything. So we need to live our lives with love for others, but also love for God. John 14, 23 Jesus says simply, if you love me, keep my commandments. See, love should be the motivation for the things that we do. To grow beyond simply serving the Lord out of a fear of punishment or out of, out of a sense of obligation, but to serve him because we love him and we love the people that he loves. Add to your faith love. Then look at verse, uh, yeah, I missed some slides there, and that's on me. Look at verse 8, though. Well, now that we've considered all of these qualities, he says in verse 8, For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren uh, nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The thing is, we cannot help but become better people when we commit to all of these ideals. When we try to grow in these areas, we will do better. There is going to be growth and fruit from it. But then verse 9, right? In our journey of spiritual growth, remember where you came from. Look at verse 9. It says, For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his own sins. I think sometimes... We can get down on ourselves when we look at where, where we are and we look at where we want to be in our spiritual journey and we think, oh man, I've, I've still got, so, I've got such a long ways to go. I've got so many more things that we need to do. I encourage you, look back to where you were and see how far you've come. 
Sometimes that can be all the motivation we need to grow spiritually and to keep going is to recognize, you know, when I look back, I'm so much better than I was 10 years ago, 5 years ago. I have, I have grown and I want to keep going. We'll never a tru- truly appreciate that progress until we recognize that all of us started from a place of darkness. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, if we don't continue to strive for spiritual growth, I think it shows that we don't really appreciate what it means that our sins were forgiven. What it means to have been called out of a place of darkness and hopelessness. And so forgiveness of sin should be the motivation. Rather, not that we're seeking it, because that's what we got when we were baptized into Christ, but the fact that we were forgiven should be that motivation for us to keep going, because we know where we were, and that's not where we want to be again. But then finally, have assurance through spiritual growth. Let's look at verses 10 and 11. It says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble, for so an ab- For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When we commit to growing spiritually, it leads to stability. Here it says that we will never stumble. When we grow spiritually and we seek these things, we place ourselves on solid ground. And through that spiritual growth, We are developing into a person who is not going to be shaken by these things. It leads to a more, a a better and a more stable life here when we commit to growing, right? It's just like a, like a plant, right? You see a a, a high winds or tornadoes come through. It's going to be those, those trees that have roots that are deep, that withstand all that pressure. Their, their growth is what led to them being solid and stable and immovable, and that's, we, we have the assurance that when we grow, that's how we can become. In Hebrews chapter 6, 11 and 12, says that we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises, right? He says, to the full assurance of hope, meaning that we can have confidence that what we are doing is right and is leading us to the right place. It brings us to our last point this morning. Growth leads to eternal life. The greatest benefit to living a life that is centered around spiritual growth and, that, and, and making spiritual growth our goal, seeking it with diligence, is that we can make our calling and election sure. When we are growing, we know that we are pleasing God. And we can know that when this life is over, we have a home in heaven with our Lord. When we are growing, we know that we have life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. That is the reward that awaits the faithful in Christ. At the end of our spiritual journey, when all of this earth is done, if we have been growing, that's what waits for us. Eternity, together with our Lord and with all those who are faithful to Him as well. Perhaps you're here this morning and you've not yet begun that journey of spiritual growth. I'll tell you, there's no better time to start than now. There's no better time to start. You know, sometimes we, we can put things off and say, oh, well, when this milestone happens in my life, maybe I'll get things back together. Or, oh, well, you know, maybe I'll wait till the new year and I'll make a New Year's resolution of things will get better. Or, oh, you know, uh, things are busy. Maybe I'll wait till my kids are out of school and it's the summertime. No, there's no better time to start improving your life than now. And there's no better improvement you can make than if you are outside of Jesus Christ to say, you know what? I know that Jesus has done 
great things for me. He's died for me so that I could have the hope of heaven with him. There's no greater change you can make than to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins and to put Christ on and to become a Christian, to become a part of his family and to grow together with us. Perhaps you're here and you have, you have that need. Come to the front. We'll, we'll talk to you. We'll let you know what you need to do and you can become part of this family. For the rest of us, I hope this is an encouragement to continue to grow spiritually. That our life shouldn't just, I don't want us to be stagnant. I don't want us to stay where we are, but I want us to keep moving forward to continue growing so that we can be the people and the children of God that he wants us to be. This morning, if you're subject to the invitation, won't you come while we stand together and while we sing. What can wash away my sin? Behold again, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see, of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Naught of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Be seated, please. John's coming down to make some announcements. We'll have our shepherd's prayer, and then we'll have one song, one verse of one song following the announcements and prayer. What a glorious morning to be together. We thank you, who are especially those who have come to work with us this week. We're looking forward to the campaign that's going to start, starting today, be going on through next week. As part of that celebration, today we are having what you might call a potluck because it's called a potluck dinner. We have prepared food for you. We invite you to stay. We want you to stay. The procedure for this is going to be pretty simple. When it's time for to be dismissed, we will go out, follow your nose. It's a whole lot better than ever just listening to my telling you, go this way. The tables will be there. And by the way, before we leave this morning, during our shepherd's prayer in just a moment, we will give a blessing for the food so that you can just go right on out, start the serving, eat. We made food. We don't want to take it back home. Eat, eat. At any rate. Now, my eyes are bad, so I'm going to bring this paper up here so when you hear it rattle, you know, you can see what's up there. It says announcements, okay? There's a few more things written down here, but you know, for, for blind folks, we gotta read, okay? Don't forget that our campaign starts this week. Your daily prayers are solicited. Your daily work is even more appreciated. We have these wonderful visitors who are here to help us do this, but it is our responsibility to reach out to these souls. We are here to grow God's kingdom. It's not for the numbers in this building, although hopefully that will be a positive benefit. It's for the souls that are no longer belonging to Satan. 
It's for the souls that are going to be belonging to Christ. In addition to our campaign that's coming up, we normally have a Tuesday morning ladies' Bible class and a mission work, uh, mission printing work activity. This week that will be suspended so that you can come up here and work on the campaign. Okay, remember, campaign, campaign. Okay. And next week, not three days from now, but next week we will be having our first responders luncheon. As always, the first Wednesday of every new month. Please, please sign up for those things. If you can help in any way, whether it's bringing food, whether it's helping to serve food, whether it's paying for food, whether it's, hey, we just want to be nice, here's money, and we'll wave it around at people. We usually get more people coming in when you wave money around. I don't know. You know, no, really, we're looking for your efforts here as we continue to try and respect those who take care of us on a day-to-day -day basis. We have had members in our family here that have been struck by fire. We have had members here that have had automobile accidents that we have had the first responders come and personally take care of us. Let us or help us to give back and show appreciation for those. That's coming up again Wednesday, next Wednesday. For those of you who are here and don't have these, these magic little name badges that say who you are and where you are, things like that, we have a plan for you, especially some of you volunteer workers, because as you go out, we want people to recognize who you are and who you're with. So through home missions, through the efforts of some of the folks here, we have the ability that we're going to make name badges. There will be a sign-up sheet out there. Of course, out there means a lot of place, so ask somebody. There'll be a sign-up sheet out there. There is one out there. Come out there, sign up for it, and we will get a name tag made for you. It'll have a lanyard. It'll be stamped in plastic, and hopefully we'll have your name on it because what's the point of a name tag without? So if you would like one, sign up. If you don't like one, sign up anyway. We still want to know who you are. You know, people like me, I don't, I don't, my memory's shot. I need to know that, uh, that, uh, that my mother-in-law out here really is named Billy Ann. You know, just because I've known her for some 50 years, it does not, doesn't seek in sometimes. So the main thing is so that you can recognize the people around. If you go out and do some work with the campaign, yay, thank you very much. But it would be nice for people to be able to see who you are. Sign up. It's, it's by the way, it's free. It's okay. We don't have to pay for it. We've got it covered. Thank you so much. Uh, if you would, join me in prayer for just a moment here. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the family that's represented here in this building. And thank you for the future family that you're going to get us introduced to in the next week or so. We know that that next week is a, a big push to get people exposed and involved with you. Help us to continue that work when that push is over that we may continue to reach out to our community, that we may continue to represent you as we reach out in this community. For you've done everything for us. You do everything for us. You are everything to us. You made us. You understand that we can sometimes not ask for the right thing, that we sometimes can't even ask for a thing, the spirit you give us understands that and translates for us. They understand the deep inner needs that we have. Father, thank you for that spirit. Thank you for your son who make all these things possible. And while we're on the subject of thanks, Father, thank you for the food that we're about to partake of. Thank you for the hands that prepared it and for the spirit of those who are working to serve and, prepare and have prepared for us. May it be the nourishment of our bodies that we may continue to do work for you in this community, that we may continue to represent your son, not for our glory, Father, but for yours. 
We thank you again through your son. We thank you for the life he lived, the life he sacrificed, and the life he lives now. Through his name we ask these things, and amen. Amen. Let's be standing for our closing song. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. You're dismissed.